when we record uh, bhaja pod what happens is that we usually get distracted and talk about a lot of different things news of the week such and such i have been wondering if uh, there is a more serious way to do it and uh, i wanted to try an experiment which is going to be this episode it will be about a, a deeper dive into certain things in delhi one of the candidates was a congress party sikh who made impressive use of bicycles and other means of transport for his campaign there are about a million voters in delhi out of a total indian electorate of well over 170 million men and women it's a three month affair and mr nero who's traveled thousands of miles through the country has of course been campaigning for congress as well as urging the people to exercise their new democratic right to vote on the 14th of december 1953 sukumar sen an indian civil servant bid farewell to sudan after 10 months as chairman of the electoral commission which had just overseen sudan's first self government election after the election was completed sen spoke on sudanese radio of this very happy chapter of his life he exhorted that the people should trust their politicians who he said were all wise and patriotic in government or in the opposition you will find them all working for the ultimate good of the country but he warned them that in view of sudan's under development they would have to work very hard for many long years to nurture the plant they and he had sown still he hoped that their experiment in free elections would be an example and a source of inspiration to the arab and the african world sen's work in the sudan was the subject of a stirring tribute in the egyptian newspaper al misri in its issue of 18th december 1953 it called the indian one of those men who were born to lead the pitched battles of for democracy your election he told the people of sudan can legitimately claim to have been a model of its kind sen worked 10 months there to set up the country's election machinery and made it work perfectly but why was sen assigned to supervise elections in sudan why did they not reach out to western men more trained in the ways of democracy after all sudan was a country that had just gained independence from british colonialism and whose voters were mostly illiterate the reason is sudan had seen what most of the world also saw sen had done something that most thought was impossible some came on foot some by conveyance some too feeble or infirm were helped to achieve their fundamental right the right to exercise their vote nearly 106 million votes were cast which meant a poll of 60% for the house of the people alone the largest democratic elections in world history were an unparalleled success they went their way efficiently and peacefully thanks to adequate precautions to the efforts of the officials but most of all because of the wisdom and action of all of those who voted sukumar sen ran the first and the largest then general election the indian election of 1952 Remember when India was going to polls in the late 1951 because yes the Indian elections of 1952 started in October 1951 Prime Minister Liaquat Ali Khan in neighboring Pakistan had just been assassinated pushing the country towards the first of its many military dictatorships the government of South Africa had just disenfranchised the cape colored people the last non white people who had voting rights in the country Vietnam had plunged into war against the French and the prime minister of Iran was assassinated too. So what did Sukumar Sen do? In Sudan, he spent 10 months organizing the elections, modifying partially the Indian laws and procedures on the subject to suit the need of the Afro-Arabic nation. The election in Sudan based on a universe utter suffrage were a success, notwithstanding its literacy rate of a mere 2%. Sen afterwards returned to India and further refined the election process for the second general elections in 1957. The first elections of India were a story unto itself. Nehru was in haste for a quick general election by the spring of 1951. But Sen was firm in his decision to defer the election till autumn. After all, he had to build 
the electoral apparatus, infrastructure, staff, training facilities and so on, from nothing. New recruits of the Election Commission of India and other government agencies had to conduct house-to-house -house surveys across the country to prepare the election electoral roles. It was not easy to involve women since those from conservative families refused to decide, disclose their names. They enrolled themselves as, say, A's mother, B's wife or C's daughter. Sen issued an order to strike off such women's name from the rolls. Harsh. And as a result, 2.8 million women voters were not allowed to cast their votes in the first election. Sen visited almost every state and ensured mock polls were held. He introduced the use of indelible ink on voters' fingers to prevent impersonation. Sen also used the media, newspaper, radio, and a film to educate the electorate. There was a documentary created, which was shown in 3,000 cinemas across India to enlighten voters about the election process. On the subject of the women whose names were erased, he hoped that this action would further enhance the democracy by the next elections, and these women will open themselves up to having their names enrolled in the electoral rolls, the actual names. In 1956, a piece titled The First General Elections in India and Indonesia in the journal Far Eastern Survey, Irene Tinker and Mill Walker wrote, the resulting furor over the omission of these women's names was considered a good thing by the elect electoral commissioner. He hopes that the prejudice will vanish by the time the new electoral rolls are complete in the next elections. Numerous inquiries were received from countries in the Middle East, Africa, and South America for detailed information on the elections. India's reputation as a democratic nation received further international endorsement when Lok Sabha Speaker G. V. Mablankar was elected as the chairman of the General Council of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association in 1956 in Jamaica. It was the first time that an Asian member had been elected to the chair. After all, the barometer of success of a democracy is not only regular holding of elections only. Though electoral process is important, how good the system is is dependent on how the loser looks at the fairness of the system in which he lost, he or she lost, also determines the success of elections. An American journalist wrote in 1951 to give you some context on what they thought of India and the elections. India seems only two things to us, famines and Nehru. That was the India inherited by the first prime minister in 47. The then American ambassador to India, Chester Bowles, thought that poor countries needed a period of rule by a benevolent dictator as preparation for democracy. He was fearful of a fiasco as the proposed elections by Nehru. He dubbed them as the biggest farce even ever staged in the name of democracy. It was unbelievable that a poor population, populous country could think of elections. In 1950, the proposed election was the most daring gamble in the history of democracy. With no election commission in existence and no electoral role in place, and due to the harsh climate and challenging logistics, the election taking place uh, in 68 phases, a total of 1,96,084 polling booths to be set up, 27,527 booths especially reserved for the women. It was a massive challenge. The organizer, the mouthpiece of RSS, in January 7, 1952 edition wrote, they were very skeptical of the whole process. Mahatma Gandhi, during his lifetime, called the, pro the possibility of the first election being this early, a precipitate dose of democracy. Rajan Prasad was not sure about leap, this leap into the dark. Educated rich and illiterate poor standing in the same queue jump-started the poor country into a vibrant democracy. Many doubted universal suffrage could work in a land of such high illiteracy. A respected Madras editor complained, a very large majority will exercise votes for the first time. Not many know what the vote is, why they should vote, and whom they should vote for. No wonder the whole adventure is rated as the biggest gamble in history. A recently dispossessed Maharaja argued that any constitution that sanctioned universal suffrage in a land of illiterates was crazy. Imagine the demagoguery. 
the misinformation the dishonesty possible said he said the maharaja adding the world is far too shaky to permit such an experiment but when the elections happened they were something else a scholar from the london school of economics described how a young woman in himachal walked several miles with her frail mother to vote she said for a day at least she knew she was important a bombay based weekly marvel at the high turnout in the forest districts of odisha where tribals came to the booths with bows and arrows one booth in the jungle reported more than 70% voting but evidently the electoral commissioner sukumar sen had got at least some things wrong for the neighboring booth was visited only by an elephant and two panthers however nobody questioned the impartiality of sukumar sen chosen by pandit nehru not even his bitterest critics like jb kripalani or the then young hero of the quit india movement jay prakash narayan nobody accused the incumbent with the use of state power to win the election sukumar sen before becoming the chief election commissioner was the chief secretary of pc ghosh the prime minister of bengal yes the then chief minister of bengal was titled prime minister so he was the first chief minister of bengal he was big because he was a mathematician and a statistician and that is what was required to conduct the first election in india pc ghosh his old boss was no nehru acolyte in fact he left congress and fought elections against them to become cm once more in 1967 politicians are always compromising they have to by some circumstance i became prime minister of india i have to hold myself in check all the times so what i say otherwise i shout out from the house tops what is happening all over the world a visiting turkish journalist admired nehru's decision not to tow the line of least resistance and follow other asian countries into a dictatorship with centralization of power and intolerance of dissent and criticism nehru had wisely kept away from such temptations yet the main credit according to the turkish writer goes to the nation itself 176 million indians were left all alone with their conscience in face of the polling box it was direct and secret voting they had their choices between theocracy chauvinism communal separatism and isolationism on the one side secularism national unity stability mod- moderation and friendly in- in- intercourse with the rest of the world on the other his words not mine they showed their maturity in choosing moderation and progress and disapproving of reaction and unrest he was so impressed he took a delegation of his countrymen to meet sukumar sen the chief election commissioner showed them samples of ballot boxes ballot papers and symbols as well as the plan of a polling station so that they could work to resume the interrupted progress of democracy in their own country now after 70 years the university of gothenburg has classified india to be an electoral autocracy this year it dubbed it as one of the worst autocracies in 2020 the economist intelligence unit classified india as a flawed democracy in 2021 the think tank of washington freedom house called india partly free freedom house report had two parts one on political rights india gets a high score of 34 on 40 the report gave almost full marks for free and fair election impartiality of the election commission that is the election system foundation of which was laid by the first prime minister is impartial india scored badly on civil liberties freedom of expression freedom of religion academic freedom freedom for ngos rule of law under the present prime minister a recent pew survey said 65% of indians would support an autocracy meanwhile that old demon that haunts our politicians still nehru said in an election speech about some of his former colleagues like ambedkar kripalani and jay prakash narayan we want a number of such men with ability and integrity they are all welcome but unfortunately all of them are pulling in different direction and doing nothing in the end on his rallies sometimes there was a sparkling of hostilities among the crowd in northern india jansang supporters would shout at nehru's rallies that he was not to be trusted because he ate beef coming across a group of communists waving the hammer and sickle nehru asked them to go and live in the country whose flag you are carrying why don't you go to new york and live with the wall street imperialists the crowd shouted back an american photographer on assignment in himachal pradesh was deeply impressed by the commitment shown by the election officials 
one official had walked for six days to attend the preparatory workshop organized by the district magistrate. Another had ridden four days on a mule. They went back to their distant stations with soon gurney sacks full of ballot boxes, ballots, party symbols, and electoral lists. Uh, which seems to us India is the most wonderfully magnanimous country. Uh, can you explain this uh, remarkable phenomenon of forgiveness? Well, partly we don't, uh, I suppose, hate for long or intensively. But chiefly, I think, because the background that Mr. Gandhi gave us during all these past decades. After all, you were in prison yourself 16 years, and you don't seem to have any resentment about it at all. You take, oh, we might almost be popular people in India. It's an astonishing thing, really. I think it's a good thing for a person to go to prison uh -huh. for a short while. Uh, and to be Prime Minister for seven years. I was, going to, I was going to ask, looking back on those seven years and remembering all the hopes that were expressed at the time when India gained her independence, do you feel that uh, they have been years that of uh, satisfactory achievement or have you disappointments, Prime Minister? Both. I think we have certainly achieved much. And there has also been, uh, well, a lack of achievement. We haven't done what we wanted to do, so it's both satisfactory and unsatisfactory. Could you elaborate that a little? What have you uh, been disappointed in? That's rather a big question. There are so many things in India. Can I yeah. give you a lead about uh, democracy and the, the uh, progress of political uh, democracy in India? Well, generally speaking, I would say that politically, we had advanced uh, the unity of the country. We've put an end to all the old princely states. We've had these general elections, which were remarkable uh, on a tremendous scale. And uh, we've built up a good democratic uh, structure. On election day, the photographer chose to watch proceedings at an obscure hill village named Bhuti. Here, the polling station was a schoolhouse which had only one door. Since the rules prescribed different entry and exit, a window had been converted into a door with improvised steps on either side to allow the elderly and ailing to hop out after voting. The new American ambassador to India, finally, Chester Bowles, after seeing the elections, was mighty impressed. Arriving in Delhi in autumn of 51, he confessed that he was appalled at the prospect of a poll of 200 million eligible voters, most of whom were illiterate villagers. He feared a fiasco. Even as the Madras Mail put it, the biggest farce ever staged in the name of democracy anywhere in the world. But a trip through the country during the polling changed his mind. Once he had thought that poor countries needed a period of rule by a benevolent dictator as preparation for democracy. But the sight of many parties contesting freely and of untouchables and Brahmins standing in the same line persuaded him otherwise. He no longer thought literacy was a test of intelligence, no longer believed that Asia needed a series of Ataturks before they would be ready for democracy. Summing up his report on the election, Bowles wrote, in Asia, as in America, I know no grander vision than this government by the consent of the government. Some years ago, we made a trip with destiny. And now the time comes when we shall redeem our pledge. Sanmanya Adarmiya Didi